about contaminants in New Hampshire loons. And contaminants have been a very important part of LPC's research uh, in recent years. And when people think about contaminants in loons, if my slide will advance here. Um, oops, there we go. When people think about contaminants in New Hampshire's loons, um, or I should say contaminants in birds, people probably often think about the bird at the top of the picture, more so than the bird at the bottom of the picture. Um, eagles, of course, were famously devastated by the effects of DDT um, on their eggs. As many people know, DDT caused eggshell thinning, which then caused the eggs to be crushed when the adults sat on them. And this eventually drove the population down to such low levels, of course, that they were placed on the endangered species list uh, in the United States. Um, but once DDT was banned in the 1970s, the eagles started recovering. And I'm sure many of you have been able to observe that um, around lakes in New Hampshire as the eagles um, have been coming back. The New Hampshire population of eagles has really um, been growing by leaps and bounds in recent years. But what about the loons? Um, you know, are the contaminants showing up in loons too? And if so, um, how might the loons be affected? And we would certainly expect to see contaminants in loons because like eagles, uh, loons are high up on the food web. And um, a characteristic of many contaminants, including DDT and including many of the contaminants we'll be talking about this evening, is that they work their way up through food webs. So for a species high on the food web, um, loons are certainly um, susceptible to these contaminants and these contaminants increase in concentration as they go up the food web. So let's just have a little food web review um, session here. Think back to everybody's um, days in biology class. So this little schematic um, is using PCBs as an example, and we'll be talking about PCBs a little bit later tonight. And uh, so basically what happens is the PCB goes into um, a lake ecosystem, it goes into the water, and it also goes into the sediments. Um, and of course, bacteria that are in, whether in the water, in the sediments, will absorb those contaminants. And then, of course, these bacteria are in turn eat, eaten by some of the plankton, phytoplankton um, or the zooplankton, um, and then up the chain it goes. So these plankton are then eaten by aquatic insects. Um, those insects might be eaten by things like crayfish. Um, of course, the Crayfish are also feeding directly in the sediments themselves. Um, and then those insects and the crayfish get eaten by the smaller fish, things like panfish, like sunfish, um, as well as perch, um, other types of fish like that, who then in turn get eaten by the big fish, lake trout, bass, um, um, the uh, landlocked salmon, things like that. Um, and of course, what's not on this picture, but what I conveniently placed at the top of the picture is our loons, um, who will eat both the small fish, the panfish, like a loon with a sunfish here, as well as these really large fish. And of course, what we have to remember is that at each step of that food chain, um, the con concentration of the contaminants is increasing because so Think about that, think about that sunfish. It might be eating a lot of aquatic insects or the perch might be eating um, a lot of insects and a lot of crayfish and all of these contaminants that have been ingested by many plankton that are then eaten by some of those insects or eaten by the crayfish. And then these fish eat many of those crayfish. So there is a um, multiplying factor as you go up the food web of these contaminants. So by the time you're in a fish that might be eaten by a loon, um, levels of contaminants could be tens of thousands of times higher than what they originally were in the water or in the sediments. So this is a process that's called biomagnification. And um, so basically all it means is that loons are getting a very heavy dose of contaminants because these are all contaminants that work their way through the food web. And of course, the other issue is that loons um, 
are a long-lived species and long-lived species tend to accumulate these contaminants in their bodies. So we don't really know exactly how long loons live, but our best knowledge is between 25 and 30 years. And over that long lifetime, not only are loons eating all of these contaminants that have concentrated on the food web, but these contaminants that we'll be talking about this evening are the type of contaminants that bind to fat cells. And so loons can build up these contaminants in their tissue over the course of a long life. So the combination of these factors, a long-lived species that's high up on the aquatic food web, makes loons very susceptible to these contaminants and also a very important indicator species for contaminants in the environment. So the story of LPC's research into contaminants um, started on Squam Lake. Um, and the precipitating factor was the sudden decline in Squam's loon population. Um, so between 2004 and 2005, Squam lost in a single year, 44% of the paired adults on the lake. We went from 16 pairs of loons on Squam in 2004 to nine pairs of loons in 2005. And this was the largest single year drop in a loon population on a large lake that LPC had seen in its 45 year history. And this was followed by years of very poor breeding success um, on Squam. So as part of LPC's investigation into what happened on the lake, um, we started looking at contaminant levels in loon eggs as simply one factor among many um, that may have contributed to the decline of loons on Squam. And as we're looking at these loon eggs, we sure enough found elevated levels of contaminants. And I just do wanna stress that this is not the only factor um, that seems to have contributed to this decline in Squam's loons, but it may well have been um, a contributing factor in that. When we first started testing um, loon eggs in 2007, um, we tested in addition to eggs from Squam, um, a handful of eggs from other lakes around the state as well. But starting in 2014, um, we have been systematically testing a number of loon eggs every year from lakes throughout the state. And the results that we found from these lakes have really been just as intriguing um, as what we found um, on Squam. So uh, it's, it's been uh, something to watch these results. Um, but I first wanna just talk about the eggs that we are testing. Um, so we are testing only unhatched eggs from failed nests or nests that have been abandoned by the loons. So we are not testing eggs that could potentially have turned into a little loon chick. Um, so Loon Preservation Committee works under state and federal permits um, to collect these failed eggs um, for our research. And LPC has a protocol in place um, for collecting these eggs to ensure that these nests have in fact failed or been abandoned. So what we'll do is we'll go in, we'll put a little mark on the egg, and then we'll wait for 24 hours um, before we return, see if that mark is in the same place. And if it is, that tells us that that nest has failed or been abandoned for whatever the reason um, by those adult loons. So only at that point will we then pick up that egg um, and bring it back to LPC. Um, and that egg then becomes a potential candidate for our contaminants research. Um, once we've selected eggs uh, that we wanna test, we send them off to a laboratory in Canada um, that does this very specialized um, contaminant testing on these eggs. So to date, LPC has um, tested 82 eggs from across the state. And this map shows you um, where all these eggs have come from. And so we have a cluster of eggs here in the North Country, um, including um, First Connecticut Lake, which is hiding behind the label for Lake Francis there, but First Connecticut Lake was done as well. Um, and then I'm just gonna zoom in more on the Southern part of the state to give you a better look at some of the lakes that we have tested um, these eggs from. 
So the contaminants that I'll be talking about tonight are what are called organic contaminants. And that simply means a carbon-based um, contaminant. And these are divided into basically two general categories known as emerging contaminants as well as legacy contaminants. And the legacy contaminants are the ones that have been around for quite a long time. They were banned many decades ago. The emerging contaminants, um, it's not to say they haven't been around for a while and been in use for a while, but generally it's more recently than the legacy contaminants. And really we're only just starting to better understand the environmental impacts of these emerging contaminants. So under the header of emerging contaminants, we have the PFAS contaminants, which I'm sure many of you have been hearing about in the news in recent years um, with um, various well contamination issues um, and things like that with the PFAS. Um, and PFAS includes stain repellents. Um, it's part of Teflon. Um, it's also used in firefighting foam. And you don't have to remember this as we talk about each contaminant class, I'll review um, what these are used in just to refresh your memory because it can be a little hard to uh, keep these all straight. Um, we also have the BDEs, which are flame retardants. And these are flame retardants that are used in consumer products. So clothes, furniture, electronics, things like that. The legacy contaminants, the names will certainly be well known uh, to most people is include PCBs, which are used as industrial um, insulators and cooling agents. Um, also, of course, DDT and chlordane, which are both pesticides. Um, and dioxins and furons, which are byproducts of various industrial processes. And the uh, important thing to remember is that these are all persistent chemicals, um, meaning that they stay in the environment for a very, very long time. They may break down to some extent, but even those breakdown products are very toxic and very persistent. So something like DDT, for example, is banned in 1972, um, but it's still around. Um, and these contaminants, once they're in the environment, they just don't go away. So these are, this is a very, very problematic group of contaminants. But what does this mean for loons? Um, so we talked about the eagles and the egg sac women. Um, one of the issues with dealing with these contaminants in loons is that these effects on loons are really unknown. Um, because one of the key ways of understanding how contaminants work on an organism um, is a laboratory study. So basically, we would, have, we would have to take a bunch of loons, sit them down in the lab, and essentially dose them with these contaminants. And we are certainly not going to do that, and most researchers are not going to do that either. Um, so the best we can do is really compare the levels that we see in loons with effects in other species. Um, and the types of effects that we're talking about, um, they can include everything from changes in enzyme and hormone levels that could impact the health of an embryo developing inside of an egg um, to even malformations of that embryo to even the death of the embryo inside of the egg. Um, and as far as the adults, um, we can see changes in hormone levels that may impact courtship behaviors. Um, and as a result of that, um, the adults may be less, um, they have a less chance of nesting because, you know, one or both of the adults may not be going through the proper courtship rituals and then they end up not nesting. Um, you may also have impact on incubation behavior. So the adults may have a less of a drive to incubate their eggs um, and that may leave the eggs exposed and the eggs may not end up hatching as a result. So it's a wide range of potential effects that are seen in um, species that have been studied with these contaminants, um, as well as of course, eggshell thinning as we talked about earlier. Uh, the other issue that, um, that you deal with when you look at the effects of contaminants in species is that some species are more sensitive to some contaminants than other species. And we simply don't really know how, where loons are on that continuum, how they may respond to these various contaminants. Are they more or less sensitive than some other species? It's 
it's really um, largely a, a, an unknown. So there's a lot of questions surrounding these contaminants and these uh, impacts on loons. So I'll be talking a little bit about some effect levels, but I just want you to keep in mind as I'm talking about that, um, that what I'll be talking about is effects on other species, um, the levels that have been shown to affect other species. And we just really don't know what the impact is on loons, but the best we can do is comparisons with uh, the available data. Um, for other species. So let's jump into uh, some of the results that we found. And we're going to start with PFAS. Uh, and just a reminder, PFAS is one of the group of emerging contaminants and it's found in stain repellents, Teflon, and firefighting foam. One type of PFAS is uh, what's called PFOS that you see here. And I single that one out because this is one that's been of one of the more dominant types of PFAS in wildlife. Uh, it was banned in 2002, um, but of course it is a persistent chemical. Um, I'm sure many of you have re heard the media refer to PFAS as one of the forever chemicals. Well, pretty much everything we're talking about tonight is a forever chemical, um, but just a reminder, PFAS, or excuse me, PFOS is one of those. Um, and other types of PFAS are still in use. So when we look at the lakes that were particularly high for the PFAS contaminants, um, the ones that really jump out are Winnipesaukee, um, Canopy Lake, and Arlington Mill Reservoir. And you can see here that Canopy and Arlington Mill are southeast of Manchester. They're quite close to the Massachusetts border. Um, and they're only about three miles apart as, as the loon flies, um, basically. So these two, um, are quite close. So going to the results, and when we look at these results graphs, so we have here the statewide average in this green bar here. And then um, this bar that you'll see here on the graph I'll be showing you tonight, this is a range bar. So basically we had eggs that were way down here, about 40 parts per billion, um, all the way to up here, which is about 900 parts per billion. And then we have these other eggs, which are not included in this bar here. And I simply single them out because these are particularly high levels. So this is the statewide mean aside from all these other stuff. This is the statewide range aside from these other eggs. So that's just how I'll be talking about these graphs as we go along here tonight. So here's our statewide mean, and then we have these other ones. So here you see these two eggs from Canopy Lake in 2016. These are two eggs from the same clutch. And you can see just how high these levels, this is of total PFAS in these eggs was all the way up over um, 1600 parts per billion. You see this other eggs a little lower, but that's very typical when you have multiple eggs in the same clutch. And of course with loons, it's usually a two egg clutch. Um, it's very typical that one egg will be a little bit higher than the other egg, but that they're in the same ballpark essentially. When we saw these levels from Canopy Lake, we were surprised <laughs> to say the least, considering what the levels, uh, how they compared with our statewide levels. And so we really wanted to get another, uh, to test another egg from that same area, um, just to see if this was something that was isolated to Canopy Lake um, or if it was a broader issue in that area. And so when an egg became available from Arlington Mill Reservoir in 2019, we jumped at the opportunity to test that egg as well. And sure enough, it came in very similar to the levels on Canopy Lake. Uh, in addition, we have these eggs from Winnipesaukee. Uh, you can see uh, in 2007, 2014, and 2018, um, these various high levels as well. Not quite as high as Canopy and Arlington Mill, but certainly, uh, certainly up there. I mentioned that PFOS was a type of PFAS contaminant that is the dominant contaminant or the dominant PFAS contaminant, I should say, in wildlife. And when you look at eggs statewide, you see it's roughly a 50-50 split on average between PFOS and then all the other types of the PFAS um, contaminant class. But one thing that's unusual is Canopy and Arlington Mill. Remember, these are only three miles apart. And look at how different that is. 
um, Canopy and Arlington Mill are roughly, you know, 83 and 85% made up of PFAS compared with the other types of PFAS contaminants. This is very surprising and that's really jumps out in our data set. Um, what exactly does this mean? We are not sure, but it could give an indication of the source of PFAS contamination in that part of the state. Um, people often use the various types of um, chemicals within a certain chemical class to try to identify the source of it. Um, and it's, it's like a fingerprint essentially. Um, and this, this could be some indication of where that might be coming from uh, in that corner of the state down to down close to the Massachusetts border there. Um, but it's something that um, is not 100% clear at this point, but it certainly, uh, certainly jumps out at us. Swan Lake is the only lake that we have enough eggs tested over enough of a time span to be able to look at time trends uh, of these contaminants. And you see here, um, overall total PFAS is declining um, and PFOS as well is declining. And um, this fits with um, trends of these contaminants and other species of birds as well, that you do see this declining trend of PFOS which is to be expected given that PFOS was banned in 2002. So that's good, it's going in the right direction. There are some other types of PFAS that are coming up a little bit. Um, and that's something that we're certainly keeping an eye on, but hopefully uh, this trend uh, will continue. So what about effects levels? Um, so with effects levels, we're looking strictly at PFOS here because this is the dominant type of PFAS in wildlife. This is the one that researchers have honed in on to try to understand what the effects are. And this red line that you see here, this is indicating the effect level, uh, sort of the lowest effects level where health or reproductive impacts have been seen in other bird species. Uh, you can see just how much higher than this effect level especially these high eggs are um, for loons. And um, about 60% of our eggs statewide um, exceed that effect level. But just remember, keep in mind, we, we really don't know how these affect loons, how sensitive they are. Um, but once again, this is sort of the best measure that we can use to look at effects uh, in loon species. And it's not a good, not a good sign that about 60% of our eggs exceed um, this level. So that's concerning. So moving on to uh, the BDEs. Um, these are the flame retardants um, used in consumer products, furniture, carpeting, mattresses, clothes, electronics, gym equipment, etc. Some of these started to be phased out uh, in 2004. But once again, very persistent in the environment. So Squam Lake is the lake that stands out statewide for the flame retardants. Um, and so here in this case, we have lakes other than Squam um, versus Squam. And you can see that the mean level of um, flame retardants in Squam is about twice that um, of the other lakes, um, although we certainly have some that are um, coming right up there. Um, if you remember, I had said at the beginning that we had this sudden decline on Squam Lake in 2005. And so often when I'm looking at data from Squam Lake, I like to divide it up into the years before that decline, uh, these two years of critical decline on Squam, 2005 to 2007, and then the years after that critical decline to help me understand what's going on in these time periods. And that certainly is helpful when we look at some of this contaminant data. And it certainly is helpful looking at the flame retardant data. So you see there's this apparent spike uh, on Squam Lake in um, flame retardant levels between 2005 and 2007. I say apparent spike because this is a very small sample size that we have here for this bar. We're only talking about five data points. And the reason for that is because we had so many of our loons disappear from Squam, um, during those years, we simply did not have many eggs available to test. And this is, we've tested every egg that we had. Um, so whether or not this 
these elevated levels are simply an artifact of a small sample size or whether it's real, it's a little bit hard to say, um, but it certainly shows you some of those high levels compared with other lakes. Um, and even in the before and after period on Squam, you can still see how much higher these levels are compared with other lakes across the state. Uh, this high point uh, here for lakes other than Squam is an egg from Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh, and when we look at effects levels, um, you can see how much higher some of these Squam eggs are than these effects levels. For lakes other than Squam, 30% of the eggs that we have tested exceeded this effects level. And for Squam, all years combined, over 70% of the eggs that we had tested. Um, exceeded that effects level. So um, quite a difference here. Squam is certainly the standout um, as far as blend retardants uh, in New Hampshire. So moving on to PCBs, dioxins, and furons. So now we're moving into the legacy um, contaminants. PCBs um, are from industrial insulators and cooling agents. They were banned from manufacture in the United States in 1979. Dioxins and furons are byproducts of industrial and combustion processes. Um, so starting in the 80s and the 90s in the United States, um, we see a real decline in the emissions of dioxins and furons. People were becoming aware of how problematic these contaminants were and they started trying to clean up the emissions. So we do see a decline from that period. They were also banned by the Stockholm Convention in 2001. The third group uh, in this, um, in this uh, group of contaminants is what we call dioxin-like PCBs. So among PCBs, um, of course, all of these are, you know, these are toxic chemicals. However, there's a subset of PCBs that are really, really nasty. And these are the dioxin-like PCBs. And they're called dioxin-like PCBs because um, within an organism, they function very much the same way physiologically. They cause, they basically, they hit the same receptors in the organism's body. They cause the same type of effect. So when you're looking at contam, oops, I'm sorry. When you're looking at um, contaminants, um, when you're looking at the dioxins and the furons, you can add these dioxin-like PCBs onto them because, because of the fact they function in exactly the same way. You can go through some calculations to basically make everything equal and then just add them up. So in the results that I'll be presenting to you tonight, um, I'll first be presenting just total PCBs and that's all of the PCBs lumped together. But then I'll be presenting what I call dioxin and dioxin-like compounds. And that includes the dioxins, the furons, and the dioxin-like PCBs. And the dioxin-like PCBs often make up quite a significant portion of um, the dioxin-like compound results. So moving on, um, these are the lakes that are standout for this group of contaminants. Guam, Mary Meeting Lake, and Lake Francis, uh, way up north there. So looking at total PCB levels in New Hampshire loon eggs. So here's our statewide mean. Um, and we've got a range that goes up to um, just a little bit over 5,000 there, 5,000 parts per billion. Uh, then we have uh, the lakes we mentioned, Mary Meeting from 2015, an egg from 2015. We have two eggs from Lake Francis, 2014 and 2018. And these are two different loon territories on Lake Francis. We don't have banding data from that lo those loons, but Given that it's a different territory, we're assuming they're different females, but we really can't say for sure. Um, but both of them quite high. Uh, and then two eggs from Squam Lake, uh, one in 2013, one in 2016. And these two are from the same female, same loon territory, same banded female loon. And I should mention that in addition to these two eggs from Squam, a lot of the eggs that are up here on the top portion of the statewide uh, range bar, uh, many of them are from Squam. We have any number of Squam eggs that are in that 5,000 and up parts per billion range. Um, effects levels come in there on your red line. Um, so the egg from Lake Francis, um, as well as um, the eggs from Squam um, exceed those, the effects levels for total PCBs. Um, 
When we test eggs for PCBs, we're usually just testing total PCBs. Um, but in order to get the dioxin-like PCBs, that's a whole nother test. And it's also a very expensive test. So we've only tested a subset of these eggs for um, dioxin-like PCBs. Um, so we tested some of the statewide eggs, we tested Mary Meeting, and we tested one each, the Lake Francis and the Squam egg. And that's what we'll be presenting here. So here's our dioxin and dioxin-like compound results. Um, these are, this is actually in parts per trillion, um, but despite the fact this is parts per trillion, these are very, very toxic chemicals. So they have effects even at the parts per trillion level. Um, our statewide bar here up to just about, um, just about 200, about 180 there. Um, the Mary meeting egg, Lake Francis, look at this. Surprisingly low, <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and then um, our squam egg way up here. Looking at effects levels, the Mary meeting egg and the squam egg exceed them. And uh, some of these statewide eggs are getting um, quite close to those, uh, to that effect level. So I just wanna walk you through this graph a little bit. So this is combining the PCB and the dioxin-like compound data. So everything you see in here that's blue, this is PCBs, it refers to the left-hand side of the graph. Everything that's red is dioxins and dioxin-like compounds. And the scale here is on the right-hand side of the graph. Um, but I want to focus especially on Mary Meeting and Francis because these are going in opposite directions. So as you remember, Mary meeting, it was high, but it was on, but it was comparatively lower than some of, you know, compared to Squam or Francis, for example. Yet it had very high dioxin like compound levels. Francis, quite high for the total PCBs, very low <laughs> for the dioxin like compounds. Um, so what does this mean? Um, Great question. So first of all, this data is hot off the press. Um, I just got this dioxin-like PCB data um, and did the in, this initial analysis on it last week. So this is gonna take a lot more digging in um, to really understand what's all happening here. Um, and um, um, the other issue, of course, once again, is that it could once again be a signal of the source of these contaminants. Remember how we, <clears throat> excuse me, talked about that with PFOS, with Canopy Lake and Arlington Mill, that it could indicate where the a source for the contaminants with those lakes. Similar thing could potentially be going on here, but it's something we need to look into more. Once again, putting up the effects level, the blue one here is the one for the PCBs the red one for the dioxin-like compounds. And in this case, you see here, Mary meeting well below the effects levels for total PCBs, but exceeding it for the dioxin-like compounds. Francis well above the effects level for total PCBs, but well below it for the dioxin-like compound uh, levels. Squam up here um, for both of them. So our last group of contaminants that we're going to talk about tonight is the, the pesticides, the DDT and the chlordane. These were agricultural pesticides that were used primarily from World War II on until they were banned in the 1970s. Um, these both have breakdown products that are also persistent and very toxic in the environment. And DDE is a breakdown product of DDT. It's the primary type of DDT that's found in wildlife. So that's what I'll be talking about tonight. Statewide levels here, um, DDE going up to around 900, statewide chlorine going around to 130. Once again, this is back to parts per billion. Uh, Lake Sunapee is our high egg here for DDE, Squam um, for chlordane. And these are the effects levels, on these short, the short red bars here. Um, some species have higher um, effects levels for DDE, more around the 1,000 mark. Um, so once again, where loons fall along this continuum between 500 or 1,000 or potentially even higher, uh, we just don't know. Um, statewide, 40% of the eggs that we've tested exceed this effects level. Um, and as you see, none of them do for chlordane. And actually just going back to DDE quickly, um, you know, none of them exceed the 1,000 um, 
level for DDE. So once again, it's just a question of where loons fall along this line. And of course, it's not just these single contaminants. Um, all of these contaminants are mixed together in these eggs in this chemical cocktail. Um, and we don't know how these interact. There are There is some evidence that suggests that when you put these contaminants together, some of them may be additive, some of them may cancel each other out, and some of them may act synergistically, meaning they work together to create something even more toxic than the individual contaminants. So it's basically like one plus one does not equal two. One plus one may equal four or six or 10 or whatever. We just don't know. Um, and so the loons are carrying all of these contaminants together. And one way to look at total contaminant burden that the loons are carrying, as well as to understand the various levels of toxicity from these contaminant classes in an organism, is to look at a graph like this. So basically what I've done with this graph is I've taken what percent a given egg has of these effect levels that we've been looking at, and I've stacked them on top of each other. Now, this is not to suggest that these are additive. That's not what I'm implying here, but it does allow you to compare how one group of contaminants in one egg may be more toxic than another egg and vice versa. So here we have that squam egg that we've been looking at before that was very high for PCBs. Um, and you can see in the green here, this is our effect level from total PCBs. Um, and you can see how much more that's contributing to the toxicity of that egg versus this egg here, just a little bit from total PCBs. But this is the, one of the eggs from Canopy Lake. Look at that PFOS contribution. Not surprising given those levels that we saw and how much above the effect levels it was. This, uh, using that effect level, this egg is like eight and a half times higher than that effects levels. So a graph like this um, is a reminder both that these loons are carrying a very heavy contaminant burden and also that these contaminants are all interacting in ways that we simply do not understand. So what does this mean for the loons and for other wildlife and for the people who share the lake with these loons? Uh, remember that we had talked at the beginning about loons as an important indicator species. And LPC is the only organization in New Hampshire that is systematically testing these contaminants in a species as high up on the food web as loons are. Um, so these eggs are really providing an important indicator of the levels of contaminants that are present in a lake ecosystem. And these contaminants are ubiquitous in the environment. Um, the contaminants we've tested to, or that we talked about tonight, we have found all of these at some level in every single loon egg that we have tested. Um, but of course, you know, the questions we've been talking about is what do these mean for loons? And we really just don't know how they affect them. But preliminary investigations by LPC indicate that some of them may be ha um, impacting hatching success and overall productivity of our loons. But we're going to be digging into these data a lot more and comparing them to the data that we have on loon breeding success to try to understand whether or not these contaminants are impacting uh, reproductive success for the loons, and if so, how and to what extent. We'll also be looking for indications of in what way these contaminants may work to impact hatching. Uh, this is former LPC staff biologist, Chris Conrad, and he's measuring the thickness of loon eggshells here. And of course, DDT famously caused eggshell thinning. Um, and that was a mechanism for um, what happened with the bald eagles. Um, and we'll be, there are some studies as well that indicate that flame retardants in at least certain species may cause eggshell thinning too. So we're gonna be comparing uh, eggshell thickness measurements as well as just the size of loon eggs um, and comparing them with contaminant levels and data on breeding success to try to understand if and how these contaminants may be impacting egg viability. And of course, loons are just the tip of the iceberg and not only for other wildlife, 
um, on Squam, these contaminants raise the red flag for human health as well. Um, the Loon Preservation Committee had tested sediments from some of the tributaries flowing into the lake in an effort to identify possible sources of these contaminants. And this was kind of like looking for a needle in the haystack, but we ended up finding contaminated sites. We identified three tributaries with elevated levels of contaminants in those sediments. Uh, two of them were for DDT and one for PCBs and dioxin-like compounds. Um, I'm not gonna go into that tonight, but um, I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Um, but as a result of our loon egg data and our sediment data, our New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services followed up um, on our studies with fish testing um, to see whether or not there was a risk to people eating fish on Squam, which makes sense. Obviously, loons are fish eaters. This is where they're getting these contaminants from. So um, it, for anyone who ate a fish from Squam, there was certainly the potential that there could be a risk from these contaminants. So Department of Environmental Services tested these eggs for PCBs as well as PFAS, and they found elevated levels of PCBs in fish. Uh, as a result of these levels, um, DES issued a new fish consumption advisory for Squam in March of 2020, which was much more restrictive than the mercury advisory that was already in place on Squam um, and on many other lakes in New Hampshire. Um, so if you look at these, um, they're recommending that an adult only eat uh, basically one uh, meal of perch, yellow perch per month. Um, and for children, only um, one meal of perch every three months. For smallmouth bass on other fish, they're only recommending three meals of fish per day for adults, or excuse me, per day, <laughs> per year <laughs> for adults, um, and only one meal um, per year for children. So this is really the ultimate case of loons as an indicator species, and even for human health as well. So our research goes on. Um, we're going to continue trying to understand what these contaminants mean for loons. Um, and in doing so, of course, we're working to protect loons and the health of New Hampshire's lake ecosystems as well. We'll continue sharing our results with New Hampshire Department of Environmental um, Services, as well as local stakeholders. And uh, we're all going to work together for a clean and safe environment for New Hampshire's loons, other wildlife, and people as well. And as we're doing this work, we're um, going to continue striving for a very, very bright future uh, for New Hampshire's loons. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I want to give a special thank you to New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Great. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was a really, really interesting uh, introduction and deep dive into the contaminants affecting our loons. Um, so while we wait for folks to put their questions into the chat, I will ask you one that I get sometimes uh, when I go presentations on at different you know, places of state, I briefly touch on the contaminants work. Um, and people always want to know how those contaminants are getting into the loon eggs and if, if the females are purging contaminants from their own bodies into those eggs and if that's you know, a mechanism that they're using to help themselves out. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, first thing is how they're getting into the loon eggs. So, you know, we, if they, if they work their way up that food chain, you know, once, once you have, um, you know, perhaps a flush of sediments into the lake, um, you know, those bacteria are, um, are absorbing them, the plankton are eating them, the, and ultimately the fish are eating everything um, up that food chain. And when the loon eats that fish, it is getting a much magnified dose of these contaminants um, from the biomagnification of the food web. And yes, um, so the loons are, um, the female loons uh, do um, use the eggs basically as a mechanism to get rid of these contaminants. Um, and so when, we, when we're looking at these eggs and we're seeing these levels in the female or in the eggs that have come out of the females, you know, think about the males. <laughs> they are just holding all of these contaminants. They don't have a way 
um, to get rid of them. And so when we look at, for just for example, that egg from Squam with those PCB levels comes to mind, I've often thought about, wow, what does the male in that territory look at, look like, I should say. Um, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's, um, it's, you know, you, these, these males are going to be much higher. And studies have been done on that in other species that have shown that um, this is a way for, you know, as females are depositing these nutrients into their eggs, um, the males do end up being higher in contaminant levels than the females. Um, and one of the things is these, these the contaminants that, um, the nutrients and ultimately the contaminants that go into these loon eggs um, are really coming from what the loons are eating in the three to four weeks prior to egg laying. Um, and um, so studies have shown that across the birds, bird world that nutrients that go into the eggs um, are coming primarily from what the birds were eating and the immediate lead up loons, no different um, on that regard. And um, so you think about the fact that these loons are on their territories for at least a month, possibly more, depending on when they go on the nest before they lay those eggs. And of course, they're um, very much tied to that territory. They're defending that territory against any other loons that may try to take over that territory. They're looking for nest sites. They're spending most of their time feeding in that territory um, or you know, on that lake. So let's say it's a single pair, it's a lake with just a single pair of loons. You know, they're going to be feeding around that lake. So these contaminants are a very important indicator of that location. In many ways, these, this, these, are, these eggs are very much tied to place. Um, so we know that, you know, just from basic bird biology, that this is what's going into these eggs. But just to confirm that, um, Loon Preservation Committee had done some isotope tests on some of these loon eggs. And what an isotope test can tell you is, um, among other things, um, but it can tell you whether the, the um, nutrients and thus the contaminants as well that are in the eggs are coming from a freshwater source or a marine source. Because when we first found these contaminants um, in loon eggs, people were asking us, well, you know, maybe they got them on the ocean. Uh, well, we knew from bird biology that that wasn't the case, but we really wanted to have the confirmation of the isotope test. And so we sent these eggs, some of these eggs in for isotope testing and it came back very strongly, just as we expected that um, these were primarily a freshwater source rather than mar a marine source. And as I said, we know that these loons are on territory for at least a month or more before they go on that nest. So these, these contaminants are very definitely coming from the lake and the territory that these loons are on um, before that lay, they lay that egg. And those females have the benefit of at least being able to get rid of some of those contaminants, not all of them, but some of them, um, and the males don't have that benefit. Uh, and are there ways of testing, oh, sorry, I don't know if you just heard some feedback. I got some feedback. Um, are there ways of testing for the contaminant levels in adult loons or is it just the eggs that, that we're able to test? Yeah, so there are. And so um, many people use blood, uh, blood samples uh, to test for contaminants. Um, and there have been some neat studies in some other species um, where people are looking both at the egg levels as well as um, the blood levels. You can also look at liver levels as well. Um, ultimately, LPC has decided to focus on um, the egg levels because first of all, these tests are very expensive. Um, and so, you know, there is that limitation, um, but also because the egg is essentially a closed system. Once the female lays that egg, that's it. That's your little, that's your package. And things like blood levels um, can be uh, much more subject to, um, you know, what that loon had for breakfast that particular day, you know, it might, you know, more, it's, it's, it's a more immediate thing. And, you know, one day they may eat a fish that doesn't happen to have very high contaminant levels. The next day they may eat a fish that's full of contaminants. It's, it's a much more variable um, medium for, than um, say an egg, for example. 
Um, and so we are very much focused on the eggs just because it is this closed system that's subject to less variability and it gives us a consistent look um, and a, a consistent point of comparison. Um, but yeah, you can certainly you can certainly test these contaminants in um, blood levels as well as uh, livers, another um, potential source for testing these contaminants also. Um, we've got a lake specific question. Um, so first of all, has fish testing been done on lakes other than Squam? And the, the question is specifically about Canopy Lake, whether there's been fish testing there and if so, how does it compare to uh, Squam Lake fish levels? Yeah, so unfortunately there has not been um, fish testing done on Canopy. It's something that um, I think would be worth doing. Um, and so um, DES um, was only able to test fish um, from Squam, once again, you know, limited resources like all of us. Um, a number of years ago, um, Fish and Wildlife Service had tested some fish from Squam and also from Win Winnesquam Lake. And um, they tested that those, excuse me, they tested those fish for um, the legacy contaminants. They did not test them for the emerging, emerging contaminants, but they tested them for the legacy contaminants, specifically PCBs, DDT, and chlordane. Um, and what they found um, were fairly similar levels of PCBs and chlordane on Squam and Winnesquam, but that Squam had significantly higher levels of DDT um, than Winnesquam did, um, but aside from, and that was, that was, gosh, that was over 10 years ago by this time, um, but aside from that, um, we only, um, aside from that Fish and Wildlife Service testing back from 2009, um, the only fish data we have available at this time um, is from Squam Lake, unfortunately. Okay, so that sort of answers another question we had, um, which was other than Squam, are there, is there testing of loon eggs and fish in the same environment? Yeah, um, and it's, it's, yeah, and it's unfortunate, it's, it's very unfortunate that, um, you know, once again, it, it comes down to resources, but um, it's something that based on the finding, our findings from loon eggs that we would really, um, recommend being done that, you know, if, if there was, uh, if there was a way to get more fish testing done more extensively across this, um, across this, uh, the state, it's something we very much uh, recommend. And um, you know, when it, we hope that the data that we have from the loon eggs will, you know, spur on or encourage or make some resources become available for wide, uh, more widespread fish testing statewide. Um, we have a fireworks question. So are any of these contaminants something that could have come from a fireworks source? And also um, how do fireworks affect water quality? Yeah, so these are not the type of contaminants that you find in fireworks. Um, these, have, these would have other sources. Um, there are um, a lot of the heavy metals. Um, uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot. Some of the heavy metals um, are present um, in fireworks. Um, and, you know, these can certainly um, affect water quality um, in other ways if they're, you know, if they're set off, you know, especially if they're set off too intensively from a given location, especially, if, you know, a smaller lake. Um, but these, these contaminants that we're talking about tonight are not the ones that are found in fireworks. Um, there's a question that uh, I think might have been asked before you talked about the isotope analysis. It was um, a question about, are there any contaminants we're finding in loons from the ocean since they spend so much of their time there? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess sort of going off of that question is, are there contaminants that are more common in the marine environment than in lake environments? And, and are we testing for any of those things or are we primarily focusing on these lake uh, and freshwater contaminants. Yeah, so these these are certainly present in the marine environment as well. Um, and um, you know, we you have some of these super fun sites that are off the coast, and these you know these are very much the same 
same contaminants um, at those sites in that in that marine environment as here in the freshwater. You know, these are ubiquitous and um, contaminants. They are everywhere. In fact, there are some very fascinating studies that have been done of Arctic wildlife. And you, you, you know, you have these very remote places in the Arctic and, you know, even these species are carrying um, contaminant burdens of exactly the same type of contaminants uh, that we're talking about. And yeah, so loons will certainly pick up contaminants um, in their, in the marine environment as well. Um, but as yeah, um, as you mentioned, as the isotope test indicates, these this is a that's a very small component of the types of or excuse me of the contaminants that we're seeing in the eggs. So they're certainly picking them up. It's certainly adding to a loon's overall body burden of contaminants, um, what they get in the marine environment. But it's not what's primarily showing up in the eggs. It's very much what they've been eating in those weeks prior to egg laying. Great, well, it looks like that's all of our questions and we're closing in on eight o'clock. Um, so thank you again so much, Tiffany, for giving this talk, it was great. Um, thank you for everyone who watched and yeah, have a great night. Thanks everybody, bye.